And now we are ready for the state of USAFA to begin. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Please do join me in welcoming the 20th Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy, Lieutenant General Jay Silveria. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the United States Air Force Academy. Thank you for coming. Looks like we're enjoying a nice Colorado weather day out there, so it's nice to be inside Polaris Hall. It's a pleasure to have you here today to help us celebrate our Founders Day. Founders Day is an opportunity for us to look back at our heritage, but it's also an opportunity for us to look forward to the future, for innovation, for our growth, and for us to begin to look for new accomplishments. And that's a perfect day for us to take on the state of USAFA as we are today. To those of you, I, it's so good to see a lot of familiar faces. Those of you that uh, we have an existing relationship with, welcome back. Thank you for all the support you give to the Air Force Academy. And for those of you that are new here for the first time, welcome. And we're looking forward to, to building that relationship with you. And I'm looking forward to meeting a number of you. As Kimberly mentioned, this event is being live streamed. So uh, I'm searching, well, there's a couple cameras around, but I'm searching around the fact that there may be a few people in their kitchen or their office uh, or somewhere. All right, thanks, Sergeant Slater. Uh, welcome to those folks that, uh, that are watching us as we're streaming today. So for those of you that I haven't met personally, I am Jay Silveria, the 20th Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy. And I'm a proud 1985 graduate of this institution, which means I first came to Colorado Springs and walked up the ramp in 1981. I'm now in my eighth month in this role, and in about six weeks, we're gonna celebrate our 60th graduating class here at the Air Force Academy, the class of 2018. And it turns out that we're gonna have the distinct pleasure of having Secretary Mattis as the commencement speaker on May 23rd at, uh, at Falcon Stadium. He's one of our nation's preeminent warrior scholars. He spent more than four decades in uniform commanding Marines. He knows the complex fights that we face. We're very privileged to have him. But let me pause a minute to talk about that class of 2018 that's gonna walk across the stage and have the privilege to, to meet General Mattis and hear his words. We're gonna have 438 pilots go off to pilot training out of that class. There'll also be 69 of them that'll go off to remotely piloted aircraft. We're gonna cover every AFSC, every specialty code in the Air Force, from nuclear missile operators, public affairs, behavioral scientists, financial management, personnel, contracting, security forces. The class of 2018 will be out in the Air Force making a difference right from the very first day. As I mentioned that today is Founders Day. So as that class of 2018 nears graduation and looks out for the possibilities of those fast approaching careers, today is the day that we reflect on some of our beginnings. We are always rooted on our foundational heritage and our warrior ethos and dedicated to our unchanging core values. But we're committed to a constant pursuit of innovation at the cutting edge. We need the intellectual agility that is crucial now, more so than it has ever been, battle spaces that are more complicated than they have ever been, and lieutenants that must be more advanced than they have ever been. There is also value in looking at our roots, back at the grit, the warrior ethos, and the determination of those that came before us. We will never forget that we stand on the, on the shoulders of those giants that came before us. In 1955, 306 cadets began their training at Lowry Air Force Base, just east of Denver, and less than a year after moving to our present location here in Colorado Springs, they became our first graduates, the class of 1959. In 59 classes that have followed, we've had nearly 50,000 graduates. And in fact, our 50,000th graduate will walk across the stage on 23rd of May. This long blue line of graduates have led the development of our Air Force into the strongest and most professional Air Force in the world. It's been a privilege to celebrate this heritage alongside with a number of graduates and supporters at Founders events. I've had two Founders events in Texas. I have one coming up in Boston, St. Louis, as well as Northern California. It's a real privilege to get out and meet uh, many of our alum and many of our parents that are there to celebrate those events. Well, I'm a special thanks to uh, the Association of Graduates for partnering and arranging all of those events across the country. So let's talk a little bit about where we've been 
in my first eight months. <clears throat> One of my favorite aspects of this job so far has been just that, that opportunity I've had to get out and meet parents, grads, supporters, partners, community members, and to help us tell our story of the Academy and of the Air Force. And what's on the screen right now, you can see a lot of these are, are cuts from my, uh, my LinkedIn page where we have an opportunity to provide some thought pieces and then also my Instagram page where I'm quick to, to show some pictures of cadets and alum as I'm, out, uh, as I'm out with them around the country. So you can certainly check out those as well as our official pages, uh, the Academy's official homepage, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, and our YouTube channel, all places that you can follow what I'm doing and what's going on at the Academy. But I'll tell you, there's a consistent theme from every, from every, one, of those, every one of those pictures and every time that I, encounter the, that, that I encounter the cadets is how I am impressed with them. They are absolutely unbelievable in their sophistication, in their breadth, in their depth, and I certainly challenge anyone, if you want to question the future of the Air Force or the future of our nation, is to spend 10 minutes with some of these unbelievable cadets. So today I may introduce you to some of those unbelievable cadets, like Cadet Second Class Madison Tom. So during our winter break this year, while a lot of us were enjoying some holidays and, and perhaps eating too much uh, at the dinner table, this young lady traveled to Kosovo and did research on how different non-governmental organizations conduct, po conduct post-conflict development and reconstruction. But she's a cadet. And in this picture, you can see this is her in Korea taking part of Operation Air Force getting an F-16 ride as she's learning about the United States Air Force. She's also a double major in mathematics and humanities and has a GPA that's hovering right near 4.0. And as I run through what we've been up to at the Academy since this past summer, I'll highlight a few more of the exceptional cadets like Madison. So in August, I had the privilege of taking command from Lieutenant General Johnson uh, with uh, General Goldfein, also an Academy graduate. General Johnson, I want to thank her for putting the Academy on an outstanding trajectory, and it's our duty to continue to take that as a foundation and as a place, as a beginning, and I'm confident that we're on the right track. For myself, I would freely admit Transitioning from a 32-year combat-oriented career into higher education has been nothing but a personal journey. And thus far, it's been rewarding beyond anything that I expected. Serving here is a privilege, and this job is crucial. We're developing the very future of our Air Force in these cadets, and in that, the very future of our nation. But this task, however, doesn't come without challenges, as you all know. <clears throat> In late September, about six weeks into the job, we'd had an incident that many of you are familiar with. And many of you saw me on CNN back in September addressing a racial uh, slurs that were put on some boards in the prep school. It ultimately turned out that one of the individuals thought to be a victim was the perpetrator. But true to our message of dignity and respect, that individual is no longer with us. It's unfortunate that this incident occurred, but as always, every challenge like this is an opportunity. And it allowed for some sober reflection across our academy. It allowed us an opportunity to open up discussions about race relations and about interpersonal relations in general. Some time for us to think about how we treat each other and to think about why things like diversity are important. So additionally, about six weeks ago, with some reflection from that incident and my time here, I was fortunate enough to have a commentary on diversity published by CNN. It was a product of that time, of that reflection through that time and discussed the importance of diversity and how a diverse force is really what makes us stronger and what makes us more lethal. And it takes a strong team that's made up of a diverse talents and diverse people and diverse backgrounds that keep a place like USAFA, this base running. Logisticians, civil engineers, medical, emergency personnel, defenders, maintenance, IT professionals, on and on that help us carry out the mission. Our 10th Air Base Wing here that's led by Colonel Sean Campbell accomplishes this task on a daily basis. And our firefighters pictured here are an example of the quality of the professionals that we have here in the, in the 10th Air Base Wing. I'm personally also impressed by some of the old guys, so let me tell you about them. 
In the Firefighters Combat Challenge World Championship in Kentucky, our over 40 relay team won the championship from our 10th Civil Engineering Squadron. And I'm happy to report that our Fire Chief, Ken Halgerson, took home an individual first place in the over 50 category. So a special shout out for the over 50 category in the room here. <coughs> I think I'm uh, double clicking here. So if you bear with me a minute, I'll, uh, I'll make a connection between our football players on the right side, and these are a number of our space, uh, our cadets that are studying space, and they're working on our FalconSat program. I'll make a connection to what's going on, on on the left, a connection between those two. This fall, we implemented a strategy at our football games to increase our fan experience, to uh, help uh, drive a purposeful engagement with our sponsors and media channels, and we wrapped that up in November with a giving thanks theme at the week of Thanksgiving at the football game against Utah State. That was one of six weekly themes. We will continue that uh, in the upcoming fall. It may have been a tough season for some very close losses for the football team, but uh, regardless of that, it turned out to be an excellent platform for us to showcase different elements of the Air Force Academy. These cadets on the left are part of our Falcon Sat satellite program that were highlighted as along with a number of astronauts and space professionals on the week that we themed as Space Week for one of the football games. Our FalconSat 6 satellite is scheduled to launch uh, sometime soon on an Elon Musk rocket and, uh, um, and you may see media coverage on that shortly. I'll also add that we'll have another satellite launching we think early fall and we're controlling right now one satellite that's on orbit. That's three satellites that will be controlled by cadets here on a ground station. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of countries that don't have three satellites that they're controlling. In late fall, many of our other athletic teams wrapped up an exceptional season, including our men's soccer team. Pictured here is cadet second class Tucker Bone, a third, who is an, an, a first team All-American. And this soccer team won the regular season championship. Our cross country team, had strong fall, had a very strong fall. Cadet second class Jackie Smith, pictured here, uh, compete, competed in her second consecutive NCAA championship. And on the men's side, that's cadet second class Mikey Davey. He led the way to the NCAA championship. He's an All-American, and that team finished 15th in the nation. This is cadet first class Jesse Singh. And in late November, we had excellent news when we found out that Cadet Jesse Singh became our 39th Rhodes Scholar. He's a mechanical engineering major. He pursued minors in French and philosophy. He did research on policy and ethics and management of military assets and nuclear weapons. He did an internship at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We're proud of Cadet Singh, and he'll do great things at Oxford University, certainly. But he also highlights we have 27 majors in our academic program, from our top-ranked aeronautical, uh, aeronautical uh, science major through humanities and computer science. And Cadet Singh represents all of the great work that's being done in those academic departments. In December, many of you saw that we received more media coverage regarding our Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, regarding how the cases of sexual assault had been handled here at the Academy. First and foremost, I've said this before, and it's worth repeating, that I'm disgusted and outraged by any instance of sexual assault here or in the United States Air Force, as a parent, as a military commander, and as a human being. Accountability in our SAPR office and adherence to the highest standards led General Johnson to initiate a command-directed investigation and take some actions against those in that office. That, that drove some turnover in that office. We're addressing those issues directly up front. We're being diligent about hiring new professionals to replace those in the office, and we're continuing to scrutinize our efforts. But he also wanted to do that with transparency. And one of the ways we're doing that with transparency, on Monday next week, Monday and Tuesday, we'll be hosting the Pathways to Thriving Summit. It's the first of its kind at our academy, and it will address issues surrounding sexual assault with an oppressive lineup of speakers, including our very own Dr. Kimberly Dickman, who's considered a national expert and a nationally regarded speaker on the topic who is pictured here. 
Over the past several months, I've met with survivors of sexual assault, and I can't help but admire their courage and commend them for their willingness to come forward with their stories, their criticism, their ideas to help me and help our institution move forward. We are certainly not alone in this battle. Campuses across the country are confronting sexual violence. It is a societal issue, and we need to, and we want to, and I expect us to be part of the national dialogue in that. We are open to all ideas. We are open to all ways that we can take this on uh, directly. That summit is a step in the right direction, but it is only one of continuous steps that we must take. This will always be a work that we will continue to progress against. This is Cadet Benjamin Hook. In January, Cadet Hook became our first cadet to receive a Schwartzman Scholarship. It's an honor awarded to 142 people each year, a national level scholarship. He will be going to China for one year to, stubble, to study global affairs in Beijing, China. So think about the contributions that Cadet Hook will bring to the Air Force, that cultural awareness that he'll have after a year of studying in China. In January, we hosted our annual research awards ceremony. It was the 22nd annual awards ceremony. Celebrating the research accomplishments of faculty and cadets. This is Cadet First Class Molly Phillips, pictured here at the ceremony, and she was the overall winner. She spent last summer working at the Defense Intelligence Agency on a secret weapons program of an adversary, and her work is still being used by our nation's intelligence agencies. Um, this is one part of the $40 million in research, in undergraduate research that we do here at the United States Air Force Academy. A level of undergraduate funding unheard of across higher ed. As an example, Stanford last year in, higher, in undergraduate education did $4 million. Most institutions spend that money in graduate level and doctoral level research. We're spending $40 million in undergrad research. And if she's not busy enough, She's also a, an accomplished member of, uh, of our cheer team and is seen at a lot of sporting events on the sidelines. In February, we are proud to award this year's Distinguished Service Award to Lieutenant Colonel Retired Carl Jansen. He's a former uh, volunteer faculty member in the USAFA class of 1968. After working in the private sector, he taught here as a volunteer for 12 semesters. He was also a character coach for the Center of Character and Leadership Development. His career is a prime example of lifelong dedication to selfless service and character development, and a direct impact that so many of our alumni have on our cadets, and I see that every single day. In February 22nd and 23rd, we hosted a very successful National Character and Leadership Symposium. It was the 25th in our Academy's history. And what I'd like to do, instead of walking you through some of those details, let me pay you a short video that recaps what happened at our NCLS. Exemplary institutions, exemplary movements, exemplary individuals who are trying to enact and embody an integrity, honesty, decency, and generosity manifest in relation, interaction, conversation with a variety of different persons. And the goal is always what? The goal is always bigger than ourselves. The goal is truth, goodness, beauty. First of all, loud and clear people, if the Allied had not entered World War II, and I do remember your Air Force bombarding Germany, because I could see it from Switzerland. So if you had not entered World War II, I would not be alive, because Hitler would have taken Switzerland also. Travel the country and I speak. I share my story and mostly work with men. And the reason I work with men is because I believe that men are not the problem, but men are the solution. 
It's a pervasive problem in our society. It's an epidemic, but it's preventable. And if we all work together, we can change it. If we're all willing to sit down and have conversations about it. So for the men, I'm, I'm inviting you. I'm not indicting you. I'm inviting you to sit at the table with me and other women and groups and organizations to end this. If you're the 90%, I would ask you to identify yourself and let other people know. Let the women know on this campus that they're safe. Let the perpetrators know that they're not welcome. Have conversations with each other. That's really my only goal, and that's why I share my story over and over and over in hopes that we will come together and change this. Powerful stuff. I knew that NCLS was successful because I received a number of letters and a number of emails uh, both praising and criticizing the speakers. In many cases, it was the same speakers, and I think that was exactly the point, for us to have that conversation. CCLD, uh, the Center for Character and Leadership Development here, did an outstanding job putting the NCLS together, so thank you very much. So in March, we had our Wing Open Boxing Championship, which is uh, uh, an important part of the Academy's annual calendar. And there are women boxing right alongside the men. We had 10 bouts of championship that night uh, that, that uh, were a real display of grit and determination by these cadets. But once again, I think there's a much better way of telling you about what boxing does here at the United States Air Force Academy. People always ask what this sport is all about. What it's like to get hit in the face. Have you ever been knocked out? Why on earth do you like to fight? But it's more than that. It's about the countless hours we put in with the ultimate goal in mind. About the blood and sweat we shed daily. Listen to the walls of the gym echoing with a roaring sound of effort. Feel every ache and pain. And ready yourself for more. Know that you have nothing left in the tank and continue to move forward. See the same look of fearless determination reflected in your opponent's eyes. And decide that they don't want it as badly as you do. This sport is not a hobby. It's not for the passive or the lighthearted. It's for those who embrace struggle. It's for warriors, headbusters, champions. If you think that sounds like you, just step right up. Because it's work time. That said, it was done by Sineda Clifton Smith. That's Cadet Third Class Sineda Clifton Smith who did that on his iPhone, by the way. In late March, uh, when it was spring break time, a lot of our cadets showed how well-rounded they are and their humanitarianism. Through funding by a number of donors, 99 cadets participated in probably what many of us would see as an alternative to spring break. They teamed up with Habitat for Humanity and repaired homes and cleared debris in nine separate locations around the country. This also highlights that throughout the year, our cadets have put forth more than 22,000 hours of community service in the Colorado Springs area and up, uh, up and down the, the front range. And earlier in this month, our legal humanitarians took home an impressive victory. The USAFA International Humanitarian Law Team took first place in the annual Clara Barton Tournament in Washington, D.C. As one of only three undergraduate institutions accepted, USAFA beat graduate level law students from top tier law schools across the country for our second championship in this competition. Last month, our hockey team capped off another outstanding season, including its seventh tourna tournament championship in the last 12 years, with another appearance in the NCAA tournament. Pictured here, Cadet Second Class Billy Kostropoulos as they beat St. Cloud State in the first round, the number one ranked team in the nation. He had a 39 save performance and made it to the Elite Eight. It was a hard fought loss against Minnesota Duluth and a congratulations to the team and, and uh, certainly an icon here, Coach Frank Serratori, who ESPN consistently refers to as a walking quote machine, and I certainly agree. But congratulations to the coach, the staff, 
and of course the team were incredibly proud that they displayed that grit and determination. And if you have any doubt of what the makeup is of these hockey team players, half of them, half of them are academic All-Americans. That brings us to this month, and we've had a busy month already. Just an hour ago, we had to quickly make the slide, we honored our 2018 distinguished graduates, recognizing alumni who've set themselves apart with significant contributions to our nation and to their communities. John Fox, the class of 1963, T. Allen McCarter, class of 64, and General Steve Lorenz, class of 1973. These distinguished graduates are past recipients of the distinguished graduates the Distinguished Service Award that I mentioned of Carl Jansen, and many others show the selfless and dedicated men and women that are part of our distinguished graduate community. And I'm grateful to get to see them every day that are actively involved in the future of our academy. And I'd put out, as these faces show, a challenge to our graduates to get out, to stay connected, get connected, share information with the cadets, what you're doing, where you have been, how this cadet experience took you to where you are, Talk to our cadets, talk to many around you, talk to our communities about your experience, your stories, your lesson learned, your journey from cadet to where you are now matters. And there are a lot of lessons learned for many. So let's talk a little bit about where we're going next. I said I've uh, spent most of my 32 years of my career flying and in operational commands, and I view everything through that prism, in particular through the prism of my last role of, the, of leading the air war in the Middle East. And based on my time in the AOR, I'm more convinced than ever that we need lieutenants that are innovative airmen, steeped in warrior ethos, and have impe impeccable character. They need to be more capable than ever and more lethal than ever to take on the challenges of our current battle spaces, complex battle spaces that they are. And I'm confident that the class of 2018 is ready to take on those challenges. Those cadets are going to graduate and serve alongside us. And in the not too distant future, as I say often, they're going to replace us. In, the, in 2049, a cadet that is somewhere on, on, the, on this academy right now is going to take over in the super, as the superintendent. So we're going to have an impact of the Air Force for decades to come. None of this happens without an amazing USAFA team here, our people. And I'm honored to be surrounded by outstanding leaders, incredibly talented group of faculty, coaches, and staff. We have coaches that are winning, but winning the right way. We have faculty and staff that are helping our cadets conduct research and compete academically among the top institutions in the country. We're not just training lieutenants, our AOCs are developing themselves as well. Many of our AOCs and faculty and coaches and staff, when they leave here, they know that in many cases they were here to motivate and inspire the cadets, but in fact, the cadets motivate and inspire them. We also at our prep school, Kearney Jackie Breeden is doing an outstanding job of preparing the preppies to excel at our academy. But it's very clear to me, and I say to the cadets all the time, and our faculty and coaches and staff, everything that got us here will not get us there. It will not get us to where we're going. We have to continue to involve, evolve, we have to continue to grow. And certainly, let me go over some of the growth that will take place in some of our physical changes here at the Academy. <clears throat> we're certainly in a wonderful new building, the Polaris Hall. And you may have noticed that there are a few projects as you run through. Maybe perhaps one of them even gave you a little frustration getting here today. Uh, our front gates, much needed improvements were made to our north and south front gates, and they were completed in December. Uh, many of our defenders are in a much better position now to defend our facility, as well as uh, welcome visitors and uh, welcome the community onto the academy. Our planetarium. The renovation of our planetarium will not just be about renovating it as a place to gaze on the stars, but it will be about STEM outreach. It's just outside this building, as many of you know. It, the renovation is underway and should be completed and open uh, this fall. We're looking forward to having that space back for the first time in 14 years. Falcon Stadium also set uh, the next stage of renovation, set to be completed in September of 18, in this September of 18 upgrades to the stadium uh, locker rooms. And this project was made possible by a number of generous donors. 
to uh, renovate and expand the locker room, provide new lockers, medical equipment that brings us up to the level of the, of the best NCAA Division I facilities around. There's some other upcoming projects. The field house is in a three-phase project and it'll be renovated and modernized and we, accept that, we expect that contract to be out this September uh, of 18. Cyberworks. As many of you know, the construction of Cyberworks that will provide a dedicated space for the innovation and collaboration of cyber research program. <clears throat> we expect to award that contract this September as well and that will be a, 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 a pub public private partnership with donor funds as well as military construction money uh, to the tune of $30 million. Many of you know our iconic chapel, and certainly if you need your picture in the chapel, I'd encourage you to do it here pretty soon. It will come down for repairs to the chapel, and unfortunately it will be down for about four years. We plan to close that chapel late this year, uh, early next year, so please take your opportunity soon. It'll go down to a skeleton, as many of you have seen the pictures, all of the panels will be redone, and it'll be brought to its original excellence. The Air Force is certainly on board with a number of these, uh, with a number of these projects, uh, but we also receive generous support from a number of uh, very generous donors that provide us funds that allow us to really have that margin of excellence, that special bit of difference, and Polaris Hall is one of those examples of that partnership. We're proud to be a part of Colorado Springs and the Front Range community, and I certainly would like to point out that uh, last fall I had an op-ed uh, published in, uh, in the Gazette about how I wanted the community come out to come out to the Air Force Academy. I want the community to consider that this is their Air Force Academy and I want the Air Force Academy to be part of the local community and to be part of the Front Range. So, I also have an important announcement that I'd like to make. So to that, I'd like to invite a number of people up to the stage. So, uh, Mayor Southers, you join me please. <coughs> Daryl Glenn, the president of the El Paso County Board of Commissioners, please join me. Chris Franz, a board member of the Colorado State of Economic Development Commission. Bob Cope, economic development officer for the city of Colorado Springs. And Jariah Walker, the executive director of the Colorado Springs Urban Renewal Authority. So our announcement today is that the Air Force is in negotiations with a privately owned company to begin development on 57 acres of the Academy's North Gate. The proposed lease includes an agreement between Air Force and Blue and Silver LLC to construct a new $35 million visitor center, which will increase the visibility and accessibility of USAFA to tourists and community members here in Colorado Springs. The new visitor center will be approximately 35,000 square feet, will include a theater, exhibits, merchandise shop, meeting, and support space. The development proposal also includes hotels, office, retail space, an indoor skydiving facility, a Santa Fe Trailhead Center as part of the City for Champions initiative in Colorado Springs. Viewing from the footbridge that will be, thank you. As the negotiations on the, on the final contract conclude, we expect construction to begin uh, in 19 and with the completion of the main visitor center uh, in 23. And this project is an excellent example of a public-private partnership using innovation, creativity, and integration with our community. I'm proud that we're part of this. I think it's going to be incredibly beneficial to not only the Air Force Academy, but the city of Colorado Springs, and really, truly the entire region. Thank you to everyone for being involved at this point, and thank you to everyone for being here today as we push this project forward. Thank you, General. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's an important part of the history of, uh, of the Air Force Academy that just took place. So now uh, what I'd like to do is to take some questions that uh, some of you may have here. I uh, also understand we're taking some questions from, uh, from online. Uh, and uh, so uh, I also have my commanders, my mission element lead, so uh, I will never hesitate to go to a friend for that. Um, oh, by the way, what did I do here? Oh, can we go back for a second? 
just in case anyone's ever worried about how lethal our mascots are, even show our own lethality. And uh, that's a flesh-eating falcon right there. So <laughs> we're making killers and we're training killers. So. All right, go ahead to the question, please. I feel an issue. I think we change... I think we change this deeply ingrained attitude uh, the same way that, that any leader would, would change that. So I take it this is probably from a cadet that uh, I think first off you have to set expectations. What's expected for performance, what's expected uh, of, of cadets that are around you, what's expected of, of cadets and, and, and underclassmen. You set expectations and then you're honest about providing assessment and holding accountable for those expectations. I think that's a, a center point for leadership, and I think that's how we get at that deeply ingrained attitude. Uh, uh, setting expectations, holding people accountable for those expectations, and providing that feedback. What's the academy doing to meet the goals of this White House? Well, uh, uh, the White House just, uh, we were, well, we had published the, the recent national security strategy, which laid out uh, uh, a, a, a turn to full spectrum conflict, and that we're expected to be taking on peer uh, competitors. And we're going to continue to do that at the academy. We're continuing to take on cyber. I've, I've highlighted cyber today. I've highlighted uh, uh, the stuff that our cadets are doing in space uh, already right here at the academy and 420 of them that are going on to be pilot training. So we're going to be able to be part of that full spectrum. I mentioned that we're providing uh, uh, cadets to all of those specialty codes, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get at that full spectrum of conflict by the lieutenants that, that we're providing. Je Secretary Mattis has insisted that, that uh, and given us that direction and that intent that we're about making, that we're always about doing whatever it is to make us more lethal. And so we're going to focus on making us capable and making us more lethal and making the cadets think that way. How about I take one? Oh. How is the USAFA meeting warfighter specific lineup sessions with you? So I, I, I highlighted some of the. Um, so now you're going to make me go back through my 45 pages. <clears throat> I highlighted some of the specialties that our cadets are going to. And I think this is a reference to less popular career fields, but, uh, um, you know, as, as Exhibit A, the class of 2018 is going to almost, I can't imagine that there's a specialty in here that is not in the Air Force. Nuclear and missile ops uh, officers, we have uh, scientists, we have security forces, we have uh, munitions and missile maintenance officers, we have contracting officers, we have cyberspace network ops, we have intelligence officers. So. Uh, we are covering all career fields uh, that, we're, that the class of 2018 and the academy will, have, will make a difference out in the United States Air Force to cover all of those career fields. How about we uh, open up, uh, if uh, anyone here uh, in the audience, uh, we have a few more minutes for questions. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've some classmates email me with a very sensitive subject, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't know what the other way to use it. What's going on with the, uh, the cross team and the uh -huh. team? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can certainly only address them in general terms uh, because we have investigations going on in both of those teams, and uh, certainly for the privacy of the individuals that are involved coaches as well as the uh, as well as the cadets I can't go into the specifics but I will tell you that in both teams we expect the highest standards of conduct as we do in all teams and all of the cadets 
And so we had reason to believe that both of those teams were participating in some degree of hazing of their fourth classmen, of their underclassmen on the team, and that is not to be tolerated. That is not to be tolerated at the United States Air Force Academy. And so uh, we're doing a, a full investigation into the, the, the members of the team as well as the coaches because I expect, I expect the coaches to know what's going on in their locker room. I expect the coaches to be leaders. For many graduates and former commanders in the room, you are responsible for everything that happens in, and doesn't happen in your command. You're responsible for, for what goes on in that team. And so I expect the highest levels of, uh, of oversight by, the, by those coaches. And I've seen it. I've seen great examples of it in a number of cases. Uh, and as far as the cadets, uh, any unprofessional behavior like that just cannot be tolerated here. And many of you know Division I, as well as a number of universities across the country, are also dealing with this same thing. So uh, we're going to take it on uh, uh, directly. Uh, we, we are, uh, we'll, we'll be very transparent about it once we were able to release as far as those individuals, but we're going to hold, we're going to hold the cadets and the coaches to the highest standard. Thank you very much, sir. Hi, Peggy. Good to see you. Yeah, that, Peggy, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this year, uh, the Warrior Games, the national level Warrior Games will be hosted here the 1st through the 9th of June. So there are uh, five service teams uh, plus three uh, other nations that will be here, uh, uh, Australia, Britain, Canada. Uh, that will be here. So there'll be eight teams competing uh, for those from the 1st through the 9th through the 9th of June. Uh, all day and into the evening. All of the events will be taking place in our athletic facilities uh, on the Academy, uh, which is unique for the Warrior Games. Sometimes they're dispersed, but we're going to have everything down uh, in our athletic facilities and on the fields down there. Uh, so the, the structure of it is that there's a contractor, a sports event management company that will be handling the venues and, and how that runs. <coughs> there's a separate contractor that handles the, the competition, the sports level competition. So all of that will be run. What we really need from the community is to come out and support these unbelievable athletes. I mean, these are the most inspiring men and women that, that these nations uh, ha have produced, their resilience, their grit, their determination to come back from the wounds, some of them visible wounds, some of them not visible wounds. We should have about 300 athletes here, but more importantly, we'll have over 400 family members. So Warrior Games, if anyone's ever seen them at any level, the family, it's a, is as important part of this for the Warriors as, as just for their competition is having the, the family members here. So I encourage everybody, get the word out. First through the 9th of June, a national level competition that will be happening here in, uh, in Colorado Springs on our, on our fields. So I'm getting the one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> currently, the pilot showed yes, sir. Major problem in the Air Force. Uh, what are your views, and uh, have you put a, a group of cadets on this problem to come up with some ideas? Yes, sir. <coughs> so the answer, the second question uh, is no, I have not put cadets on it, but I will tell you what I am doing to cadets about the pilot shortage. So the pilot shortage right now is as much about our ability to train by volume to get through to meet the Air Force's needs. So right now, Training Command can only train about 1,200 pilots per year. So with those 1,200, that does not meet the demand of what the Air Force has as far as retention, as far as retirement. So we are, that's why we are falling behind as far as, uh, as, far as, pilot, as, as a, a pilot shortage. Our role here and my role, which I take seriously, I'm responsible with these cadets for motivating and inspiring them to want to be pilots, to want to be operators, uh, to, to want to be in the operational part of our Air Force. So we have 426 members of the class of 18 that are going to sit in an airplane and fly 
and then we have 72 others that are going to sit in a chair and fly an airplane as a remotely piloted aircraft. So we have that over 500. So well over half of this class will be going off to pilot training in some manner. So we're doing our part. I actually have some cadets that I could not get pilot slots for who still want to go to pilot training. So I personally have been scratching and clawing, trying to get us a few more pilot slots. I've had some success so far, so there's some lucky cadets that thought they weren't going, who recently just found out that they're going to go to pilot training. Uh, and we're going to continue to work to see if we can get some more. But our part of that is to provide uh, uh, as many pilots as the Air Force needs. So this year, that 426 number that I mentioned is the highest that it's been in years. So it has marched up from 300 over the past handful of years up to 426. So uh, I think we should all be proud of this class of 2018, that half of them are off to fly an airplane. So thank you very much, sir, and good to see you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Let me go to the last. Let me just close out uh, to thank the community. Sir, it's good to see you as always, and I want to continue our community partnership. And certainly I would like to emphasize my challenge to grads that this is the state of USAFA, and for all the grads that are online or here today, I think we all have an opportunity to make our institution even better. So thank you very much.